We are live. It's already the beginning of December. It just blows my mind. And I want to welcome all of you to Arn. This is Paul Bromwell back again with you this week. And uh, we're right here on the Four Horsemen Network and on One True Sport. And I, as always, am joined by my tag team partner. I love this guy so much. He's the Hall of Famer, the founder of the Four Horsemen, the creator of the Spine Buster. He's, uh, again, one hell of a tag team wrestler, my friend. He's Arn Anderson. Arn, it's been a couple weeks. There's been a lot going on in your life, from retro toy Comic-Con to WrestleCade to Thanksgiving. Man, how you doing? Catch us up. How you been the last few weeks? This has been the busiest month. Time we get what's coming up this weekend figured in there that I've had. Whew, probably in five years. And I'm saying that from a positive standpoint. We've had three weekend signings. Brock and I, uh, Greenville was the first. Yes. WrestleCade was this weekend, which was enormous. I mean, it really was. It's their most successful show. So congratulations to those guys. Tracy Myers and company, all of his crew. Uh, yeah, Brian Hawks, uh, all the Mike Calandra, the whole group, man, they they kick ass with that event every year. Big time. And uh, we're much appreciative that they had us there. Saturday was unbelievable. So we're thankful for that. And uh, High Spots has a big influence on that show. Congratulations to them. Uh, it's been really, really good. We're, we're very blessed. And in between those big shows, you got to sneak in a little dinner and downtime with the family, right, for Thanksgiving. Yes. Well, what we did was we had Thanksgiving at home. Okay. Uh, we did, during the course of the next day, travel up, check in there in Winston-Salem. And we had a bunch of leftovers with us. Oh, nice. Well, other than let them sit there in the refrigerator, we said, let's just take some of this with us. And we stayed at a residence inn, so they had a full kitchen. We could warm everything up, keep everything nice and cold. And uh, we ate leftovers, which I personally yes. love. It's better almost the second time around. I'm with you. You know what I like to do, my go-to. By the way, the chat's filling up. It's great so, to see all of you here, uh, a lot of live viewers. Don't forget... Uh, you can super chat away. We'll make sure we get to all your questions. We're going to get into July 1995 for sure, but we're going to catch up with each other here for a bit. But it's great to see Rob and you, Charlie, and Daisy Mama and Carl, ATF, and others. But uh, you know what I like to do, Arn, is uh, I like to make Thanksgiving bowls afterwards. Just layer a little mashed potatoes, a little gravy, then some stuffing on top, a little gravy, a little turkey on top, little and then put that all in a bowl and heat it up in the microwave and, and kind of do the, the turkey bowl. And I had to, was doing that for multiple lunches. I might, if there's any tonight after this podcast, I might heat up another Thanksgiving bowl. It don't get old, does it? It's so good, man. I love it. So you do, and I take what you just said and pepper that down a little oh, bit. Oh yeah, a little pepper on there, and you mm -hmm. are good to go. I'm with you. ATF Media said, "Do you think hands of stone Ronnie Garvin uh, kills his own Thanksgiving turkey by punching it?" <laughs> <laughs> um, headbutt, maybe even. Hands of yeah. stone. He did He'll a pretty good. He did a pretty good headbutt too. Now, I love it. Yeah, that's for sure. And slaps and stomps. He he beat the shit out of whatever he was taking on for sure. Wow, I'm trying to tell you that. Uh, but uh, nah, man, I'm so glad you had a great Thanksgiving. Uh, I did as well. It was relaxing, and uh, I, it, you know what? It got me looking forward to some downtime at the end of the year, Christmas and New Year's, because that'll be here before you know it. You and I were just talking about that. Um, you have one more show before the, the year wraps up, and that's this weekend. It's GalaxyCon, Columbus, Ohio. We'll transition right into that. You and Brock are going to be there. This is a big one um, for you to wrap up the year, isn't it, Arn? Yes, it is. There are going to be a lot of uh, actors and all kind of celebrities there, and Brock and I are looking forward to this one. It's the first time we've done this one, either – period or together so we're looking forward to that it's going to be a really really good way to end the year 
for you guys that are uh, tuning in now, and we'll remind you at the end of the show too, Ar uh, Arn and I are going to be back next Tuesday. We're normally on an every week, two week rotation. Next Tuesday, uh, December the 10th, we'll be back for Ask Arn Almost Anything to wrap up the year right here at six o'clock Eastern. And that'll be it for us for the year. We'll come back again January the 7th. That's a Tuesday night in the new year. Um, and we'll have fun again talking all things August 95. But make sure, put it on your calendar right now, next Tuesday, 6 o'clock. Bring your questions, and we'll have a lot of fun. Uh, but, uh, Arn, as you're starting to wrap up the year, if you're in the Columbus, Ohio area, make sure you go by, say hi to him and Brock. He's got the comic books, and in hand now, he's got some hardcover comic books from the vault. We got our hands on them, Arn. I'm so excited by it. And uh, we're looking forward. These are the last of the hardcovers. You're not producing any more of these, but we have them in our hands. Got them uh, while you were at WrestleCade. And so make sure you stop by. He's got the action figures, the comic books, T-shirts, autographed pictures, and uh, make it a Merry Christmas for Arn and the Anderson family by stopping by and seeing him there. And it's a gift. Any of that merch is something you can't just buy anywhere. So if you want to, if you got a good friend that's a wrestling fan, you want to surprise them, show up with something that's not readily available. You can't go to Target and pick that stuff up yet. That's true. That's true. That's true. Hey, real quick on the merch front, I want to thank all you guys. Uh, we had a Black Friday sale. We had lots of orders come in. We had a the Cyber Monday deal over at OneTrueSports.com. Arn, a lot of Arn orders, a lot of Four Horsemen orders, and we want to continue to see that as we get into the holidays. We had someone pick up another Horseman jacket, uh, so really excited about to see all that activity. Arn sporting a One True Sport Four Horseman shirt tonight, looking style it. I love it, the 85 uh, with your name on it, I know, there too, the Horseman logo on the arm as well. So looking slick. Make sure you check us out over there, One True Sport. We got a lot of hoodies and real nice crew neck sweatshirts as well that we've been adding to the site so you can stay warm we were just talking about arm what did you say it is where you're at folks it is going to be 20 degrees tonight in charlotte i mean a, some places that, that are listening to us now that's not a big deal it's a big deal for charlotte it don't get that cold uh, I couldn't believe it when you said it because it's 33 here in Pennsylvania. So for it to be even colder in Charlotte, that's something. So, uh, Arn, hopefully you you got your Afghan out tonight when you go to watch some TV and you're all bundled up. Correct. Right. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah, all right. One more thing before we get into this and get guys, get your questions in. I see the chat loading up. I want to thank you for that. And that is, I just want to take a minute and wish... Our research guy, Andrew Hermes, he's the host of Medusa's podcast, but he's been working for a long while on this show behind the scenes, making sure that I'm served up with all the great notes and research that you hear on the show. A happy birthday. Arn, yesterday he turned 39 years old. So big shout out to Andrew and a happy birthday to the research guy. Andrew, you are a baby. He is. But you know how long it's been since I was 39, for God's sakes? We appreciate all the hard work you do. You getting those facts and figures available to us. So, you know, for me, it, it reminds me of the story. If I can get some of those stats that you put out there and plug them into what memory I got left, it, it really does help. And we appreciate you. Appreciate him so much. So we're going to jump in. We're, we're going to start. It's uh, nine minutes into the show. We got a lot to cover. We're moving on to July 1995. Go ahead, Arn. Yeah. One thing I might throw sure. in there, and I hate to interrupt you, but the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets and the Georgia Bulldogs put on a clinic oh, of yeah. overtime. What overtime college football is all about, I had never seen anything close to that were you able to catch it i saw eight overtimes and uh i couldn't the, believe it the excitement level built the the drama was unlike and i know it's my team but georgia tech was equally as efficient and equally as exciting you know and they beat georgia up for most of the game till they got to that uh 
overtimes. And I just wanted to say congratulations to both of those teams. It was something to behold. And and as you say that, I'm glad you did because the research guy, he loves college football, put it in the notes. Can you ask Arn thoughts on Georgia now in the SEC title game going to take on Texas? What do you think of that matchup? Um, I, I got to tell you, they have lucked out on a lot of games where they only ended up playing a quarter to a quarter and a half of good Georgia football. The rest of the time, they've been beat up by some teams. They've had some, you know, the they've had some quarterbacks just like Georgia Tech, just like quarterback. You know, they gave the defense hell. They're going to have to be at their very best. The ta- the tailbacks are going to have to step up, and the defense is going to have to get a little bit uh, tighter. It's going to be a heck of a game. I'm looking forward to the playoff this year for college football. The expanded playoffs, the 12 teams. Are you are you excited about that? I know I am. Yeah, uh, you can't give me enough college football. Yeah, um, or pros mm-hmm. for that matter. But really, the the college football is awesome. Yeah, and we had fun with Brock talking a little bit of football too when he was on here. By the way, a lot of, a great reception. Uh, for fans and folks of this, you know, fans of this show and people to listen to the show for Brock on the on the last episode. So, next time you talk to him, tell him we're still getting some rave reviews for uh, him being a part of it. Love to see his personality. Have him share some of those stories. Maybe you wanted him to share, and he didn't didn't want him to share. Whatever, <laughs> it was good stuff. <laughs> yeah, I'm very proud of him. He's first and foremost good a good human being and a fine young man. I'm very proud of that. And uh, he's coming along really well with his uh, pro wrestling career. Wrestled twice, Russell Cade weekend, you told me. He did. And uh, very good matches. I thought they did a good job both nights. Very proud of him, him and CW, who is a blessing. Having that veteran in the corner helping guide him is it's worth his weight in platinum, that's for sure. I'm going to put over CW too. He's, he's reposting on Twitter, our post for the show. And uh, just seems like such a great guy. And to be able to, as you said, be in Brock's corner and be there with him. Not, not dad, someone, not dad. It's great to have dad, but someone not named dad there with Brock. You can't ask for a better veteran presence. Yeah. I mean, I've turned it over to him. I don't get involved. You know, I'm there for moral support and that's about it. CW is, uh, has been a real blessing and we're, we're so lucky to have him be Brock's partner. He's All a, ble- he's a blessing to the industry. Ah, that's great to hear. That's a great to hear, especially for those maybe that haven't been as familiar with CW's career. Uh, so definitely check him out, uh, for sure. And if you get a chance to go to any of the matches and, or watch the matches, the MLW matches, check them out and support Brock and CW and uh, Bell said, Arn, we have our first super chat. And so I'm going to get to that before we start digging into July. He said, Arn, it's, I am the 83. I just missed your table at WrestleCade. Please remind me where I can get the, my life as the enforcer book, please. Will you you take care of that, Paul? Yeah. You know what? If you want to just send us, send me an email at one true sport at gmail.com. I am the 83 send one true sport at gmail.com and just put your name and that you're looking for a book. We'll get you taken care of. We'll get you, we'll get you set up on how to pay and, and get one in your hands. Uh, and so we can figure out, we just, like I said, we just got those hard covers, uh, in hand over the weekend. Arn and I are, are talking about how we're going to get those distributed, uh, to folks. And we're still working out the details, but just shoot us an email. One true sport, uh, O N E true sport at gmail.com and we'll get you squared away all right hey you're selling books and we just started hey, doing they might uh, they might check i'm sorry again how about amazon aren't they available do, on amazon do, do they still have them yeah and that's for the hardcover i'm gonna go to amazon right now and see if you can still get the paperback uh i'll just do that while we're, we're talking here because they were available the last time i checked unless they've sold out my life is the enforcer. There it is. Prime two day free delivery. You can have it by December 5th. Arn Anderson. My life is the enforcer right there on amazon.com. 
Now, if you want the hard back, uh, the hardcover book, that's where you can email me and we'll get you squared away there. But if you want that paperback book, that's where you can grab one on Amazon.com. Good call, Arn. Yep. All right. You ready to do this? You ready to go to July 1995? Let's do it. All right, let's have a little bit of a party here. Guys, listen, um, as you remember, we went over everything Great American Bash last show, and we're coming now to an event, Bash at the Beach. It's on the beach. Arn, I don't know if you recall this or not, but you're in a lifeguard match, uh, meaning it's Flair, Savage, and we're going to get to this match, but you're one of the lifeguards slash lumberjacks. You're in a tie-dye T-shirt, reddish, pinkish shorts, do you recall this event at all? It is literally on the beach in Huntington Beach, California. It was the first one of those that I had ever attended, you know, because there were no gates. There was no way to enclose the crowd. They were just stand wherever you got room, and it was, it was free of charge. It was a ton of people jammed around there. It was, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the venue, but this is also the blow-off match for the Hogan versus Vader feud, which we've been going through as we've been talking through your career the last few months. This is where it all culminates. It's a steel cage match between these two behemoths. When do you know it's time to finally close down a feud, move on from a feud? Uh, do you think, hey, this is this had to be the time for Hogan and Vader to move on? Because this is it. This is where we put a bow on it. By the time we get to the end of this match, you will see how they kind of turn the storyline. Vader actually becomes turns face and starts a, a feud with Flair and uh, and you. You do a run-in at the end to attack Vader. Um, but you think this is a good time here? Wrap it up. Cage match, blow off, bash at the beach. Well, you've kind of hot dogged it all you can, haven't you? I mean, what what do you do that is a better visual than that? Nothing, you know. I think they had a helicopter riding by overhead and giving you those shots, which are just it's supernatural looking. It's like, wow, that is impressive. And once you go in a cage, you know, notoriously in the past, that has been – Somebody is going to pay some dues for all the dirty deeds they've done, and that's what a cage is. It's to pay off. So I think it was time. I want to ask the fans. I like this to be interactive. We're doing these live shows here on YouTube. How would have you guys booked? Would you have booked WCW a little differently in 1995? How would have you ended the Hogan-Vader feud? Do you like this blow off in the cage at Bash in the Beach? Would you have done something different? Would you have cut it off, sh you know, shorter than even taking it this long, or would you have extended it? Throw your comments in the ch in the chat, and I'll read some of them as we go here. But uh, this is it. This is it for these two. So we're going to talk a little bit about the match and how it wraps up. The other piece that I want to talk a little bit about here is the Dungeon of Doom, and that's Kamala and the Zodiac are now joining the fold around this time frame. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about Kamala. Arn, your interaction with Kamala. Did you ever wrestle Kamala? Did you take a splash? Did you see the sun, moon, and stars on that belly come toward your body at all it, it, with the big splash? Any interaction with Kamala back in the, these times or even in the early days? Well, yeah, and you know that. You should remember that. I'll, 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 but, but for a more, you know, we haven't talked about it in a while. Okay, I was three weeks roughly in continental wrestling. Okay. Which, other than just a few independent matches, that was the only time that I was used in that capacity, and that's where Bob Armstrong got me booked for Bill Watts. I went out, did two TVs for Bill Watts. He said, go home, get your clothes, come back. I can use you in an underneath role. He wasn't going to mince words with me. Underneath means first match in those days, which was an opening match, wrestling match. So I drive back to uh, Baton Rouge for my first house show. I go in, I look on the wall, and guess who my name was opposite? Kamala. Kamala. The Ugandan giant with a banana on his belly, drawn on his belly. And uh, 
it was a little bit overwhelming at first. And I, uh, I went out there with a little bit of apprehension, but it didn't matter anyway, because I just got shellacked. And you no, took a big, you take the big splash. I took a big ass whooping and the splash. Yes. When do you, and again, this is forever ago, but I mean, how did you not, you know, some people like, Oh, he hits his knees on the mat first. Do you feel that belly and all that weight coming down? No, he's no? a professional. Wow. Like a yeah. feather. Yeah. He could have landed a lot heavier. I'm sure, but he didn't. And, uh, he was still what 400 pounds oh. at, he, at least 350, 375 on the hoof. I mean, he was six, six, maybe 400 now you're pounds. Make you look, look, look up Kamala's height and weight. Well, I, I think he was, uh, you, you know, why it doesn't matter. Cause he looked that big to me. Yeah. And he felt that big in the ring. Well, he felt that big. That's all that matters. That's really all that matters. And the James audience, Arthur Harris. Honey Bear Harris is there he now is. Kamala, the Ugandan, the giant. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to search. It doesn't show height and weight, but he was a big old boy. That's all. It was matters. plenty big. Yeah. Yeah. It's, we just had someone chime in. Is this pre-recorded? alias unknown. We are all the way live. Daisy mama says, I think the cage match was a good blow off to end the Vader Hogan feud. It wasn't a Vader, a fan of Vader turning face was never a fan of him being a face. Just wasn't believable. That's a great point. Vader should have never been a good guy. Well, and it was a waste of a tremendous heel. Yeah. I mean, he was a monster for, you know, all of your top baby faces to try to climb that mountain. Sting, Hogan, Savage, all of them. He was an opponent for everybody. Arn Charlie found it. He says what he found from Wikipedia was that Kamala was six foot four and 380 pounds. Okay, I was a little bit no, off, you were on the height, cool. but but the weight's pretty cool. Yeah, holy smokes! But didn't feel that splash. He was he was no. I, well, I mean, I I felt it, but it wasn't something that was going to cripple right. me or put me out of wrestling or yeah anything of that nature. I mean, it was he was there. You were aware that there was a large man that just flopped on top of you. Between that move. I think about Yokozuna and how he would bonsai people in the corner. Yep. You know how he did the sit, the butt flop yep. and earthquake when he would do the run back and forth through the ropes and then he would run and jump and sit down on someone's chest. Yep. As a kid, I just didn't know how, how people lived. Well, I'm sure it was day to day and some of them may have been flush. Some of them may have been in the middle. Oh. Some may have been okay. You know, probably, Brutal. You know, it's just a it's just a question of what day of the week was it? True. Well, I, the other person I wanted to mention, I said it quickly, was Zodiac. That's Ed Leslie, Brutus the Barber, Beefcake. This is his third character in a year, Arn. I mean, how hard is it to get over as a performer when you've been rebranded three times in in one year? It just feels like he was up against he was up against a mountain trying to get characters over like we're gullible. We can be gullible. We want to believe, but this is a bit much, isn't it? Three times in a year. Three times is a bit much. And it put him kind of behind the eight ball. To, I mean, how do you, everyone knows they look at your body, they look at your body of work and they go, well, that's beefcake. Yeah. You know, and then again, it, it's almost like the, I don't know, you can ask their audience, but it's like, the, the office can't figure out what they want to do with this guy. And each time you switch characters, I don't think you go up, you go down the ladder of success. The, the fact of the matter was after Brutus, the barber beefcake, it was so big in the eighties. I just don't think. Uh, how do you top that? Really yeah. How do, how do you top was. that? Which the, the yeah. beefcake character was over. I mean, it, it got some so good over. mileage. You know, it was, a, it was a very entertaining character and he had a great body, you know, and it was, uh, it was a good, it was a good deal. It's hard to top that. Yeah, for sure. Ryan in the chat says, don't forget about Rikishi and his move, Paul. Yeah. Rikishi was another one that, uh, he put that finishing move on you and you're wondering how they're breathing and how they're surviving after 
taken that the weight of that. Well, uh, and on top of that, Rikishi was a tremendous performer. That was just like the that was the character part that was WWE, the state face. I mean, yeah. But the fact was, if you took that out and he never did that again, he was still a tremendous worker. Yeah, still great. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the logistics. You, we mentioned it earlier about the beach, and then we'll get into the first match, which is Sting and Meng, or as Tony Schiavone called him at one point during the match, the Meng. Uh, bash at the beach. It's on Huntington Beach. It's reported 9,500 fans. WCW, Tony, and, and Heenan on the mic claimed 100,000 on the broadcast. Honestly, it doesn't matter. It looked really cool, Arn. I kind of felt like, man, it would be cool if we could see more wrestling events kind of with that setup. It was right there smack dab in the beach. They had the really cool tents, the blue and white tents, I guess, that were kind of off towards the back for the talent to kind of walk through out. Uh, what about like security? Do you remember anything? Was there any challenges with setting up a show like that? It was, it looked pretty cool though. Uh, yeah, it just lucked out cause there was no barricades, yeah. you know? And it's like, I don't know how they counted to, to know how many people were there because it was just like, okay, you're at the beach. There weren't any gates to go through or any turnstiles. You just showed up, parked There was car, no live gate for the event, man. You know, just go on yeah. right there on the sand and find a place yeah. to stand. So, the, Yeah, I mean, they lost out on ticket revenue, but it was the, about the novelty of the location. Do you think, you know, that's what they were going for, obviously, that novelty, that brand? Be different, be unique, yep. do, do yep. anything to challenge Vince. Basically, we're at war. And honestly, this is the last pay-per-view before the Monday night uh, wars begin. The very last pay per view before that would that would that would culminate that would kick off. So, well, I'll tell you what they kick off the show and from the get go, Arn. I just watched the show last night. The cameramen are dialed in. Every shot has bikini clad ladies. You quickly realize this is not your typical wrestling crowd. It's funny because there's several moments through the show. Heenan is in full diatribe. And he just completely stops mid thought. And I mean, I think it was part of a shtick to do that, but it was, uh, it was, it was amusing as I was watching the show. But as I was starting to watch the pay-per-view, I'm thinking to myself, the wrestlers, they, they got, they're actually coming out with more clothes on than anyone else in this entire setting. I mean, sting had full pants on. That's more than what you're seeing with the fans, uh, here at the beach. Uh, and then I see two guys that are way overdressed. One of them is Colonel Robert Parker, and the other one is Michael Buffer in full tux. I mean, it is hot as balls on the beach. The fans are sweating in their in their in their you know swimsuits. Colonel Robert Parker's waving a hanky. He's got his hat, his full three piece suit. Michael Buffer is wearing the double breasted suit all the way up to the tuxedo bow tie, and I, I just can't imagine what it would be like to stand in the middle of the ring. And, uh, and wearing all that get up and gear. But I mean, for the wrestlers, it's gotta be weird not being the most underdressed people, you know, in the, in the, uh, in the, in the event there. It was such a weird, crazy setting to begin with. Doesn't that really make it even crazier that he's out there in a full tux in, in the middle of the beach, right? And in the Colonel middle Parker's got his full white full gear tux on cowboy mm -hmm. hat, the whole mm -hmm. thing. That's what helps make it so preposterous. It's uh, it's it's a fun time. It's a fun show. Ryan mentions in the chat, and he's that's where I was going next. They're actually recording an episode and some footage from this, especially the Flair Savage match, and some parts from the Hogan Vader match for an episode on of Baywatch. This is going to air on an episode of Baywatch that actually won't air until February of '96. Um, which works out well timing wise, but, uh, yeah, they have a whole camera crew. Shivani mentions it during the first match. And, uh, and this was again, more crossover, um, you know, to bring in other viewers and expose WCW to another audience. Each way you could yeah. take, you could take the nine wrestling fans that are Baywatch fans and they get a little mix and, and vice versa. 
you have the opening match, which to me was was fun. It's Sting and the Meng, as I'm gonna refer to them here. They're taking on each other in a rematch. Obviously, Sting won the U.S. belt last pay per view at the Great American Bash. They they were the finals of that tournament, if you recall. But here they're the opener. And I thought, well, how's this going to be? Because that last match was nerve holds. This was a lot less of that. It was big hits, high energy, big moves. Um, and, and it was a great opener, I thought, between Sting and, and the Ming. And then at the end, after Sting gets the roll up, pins the Ming, you have uh, Hawk coming out. Hawk comes out to kind of make sure that you know, Sting's okay, ushers him out. What do you think here? Do you think, uh, as, as I talk a little bit about Hawk and Animal, what were your thoughts on could they, Hawk or Animal, ever been that true superstar singles wrestler in your estimation? Not as good as what they were. They're a team. And Paul, it was a package deal. And I don't think splitting them up would have added anything. I think it would have taken away. It was just a, it was just a good package the three of those guys i remember back in the crockett days Arn. they tried uh one of the great american bash tours they had hawk take on flair i think it was in philadelphia in a singles match i thought if if either one of them had a shot at single stardom it could have been hawk but uh just, just i don't know you to I your was, point I, they were much better as a team yeah i didn't i didn't like it yeah. I mean, it was a competitive match, and Flair just made Hawk what he would have been made him if he would have been in a tag match. But they're just, it's not Road Warrior, it's Road Warriors. Yeah. Let's talk about a guy that tried to uh, be like a warrior, and that was Renegade. And Arn, you promised us the story uh, last time we were together, but it's Renegade versus Paul Orndorff. Okay. And uh, he would defend his newly won TV title uh, against Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff. We mentioned it last month as we watched the Great American Bash. He defeated you at the Great American Bash. Orndorff gave you a hard time when you walked through the curtain. Orndorff had won the Slim Jims Challenge to be the number one contender. He's a former TV champion. And uh, this is, by the way, the only match they had someone throw sand. They used the sand that was near them. Orndorff throws sand in the eyes of the Renegade. But uh, Orndorff was over huge. And from some of the reviews that I've read and even just watching it with the crowd, some people believe that people were really cheering him because they were just so out on the Renegade and he couldn't work. And the Renegade was supposed to be the baby face. But if you go back and watch the show, the crowd was popping big time for Paul Orndorff. Well, we talked a little bit about Renegade. He was a guy that got brought in and who was going to be the ultimate warrior. And it was the ultimate letdown when they had to take off all the trappings in him. Yeah. him the renegade and what a, it wasn't his fault. He wasn't ready. He was still green, but that big, Oh God, you're kidding. I thought he was going to be the other guy who was a huge star at that time being the warrior. So I begged him as we've talked about to make that the shortest title change in history. I could have pulled that off in two minutes. Nope. Nope, nope. And it went on and on and on. And as our fans will tell themselves the truth, it stunk. Yeah. I did my best to pull what I thought he knew or could pull off and uh, tried my best. No cigar. And so I come back through the curtain and I am just, just frustrated. And the first person I run into is a guy that I respect tremendously who was a tremendous athlete double tough son of a bitch looked like a million dollars could work his ass off everything there was paul orndorff and he went jesus Arn, that sucked <laughs> said, you have no idea which brings us to this match and I made a point to not talk to him or not be around him any time during the day. 
And when he successfully went out and did not do what Paul Orndorff would normally do in a match because the other guy was not good, he came back through the curtain and I could tell he was frustrated. And guess who the first face he saw was? Arn Jesus, Mr. Wonderful, that was not wonderful. That sucked. Yeah. He went, you're not shitting. He's not good, is he? I said, no, he is not. You kind of feel for the guy. Like there were some some really bad drop kicks. Again, I just watched it last night. But you kind of feel for him because do you think he was just set up for failure? I mean, he wasn't ready. Yeah. Once the they, how much of that is his fault versus the Booker and 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 the people behind the scenes just pushing him out there and giving him that kind of push and that rub. When they pat him behind that sheet or whatever it was, and you find out it was, you know, afterwards it, it was not Warrior. They should pull the plug on it and just send him back to the school. Pay yeah. him for you know, let him train for a year, give change his look up, cut his hair, give him something different, and give him a chance. It wasn't his fault. Yeah. He was not ready for a push like that. And then to screw the audience and and say, ah, oh, it's not warrior, it's somebody else, because I guess the lawsuits prevented them from sure from doing that close of a character. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, Ryan had a question as I'm kind of reading through the chats here and he said, was anybody, you know, was nervous about the inexperience of the renegade that he would hurt, you know, himself or someone. I mean, did it ever get to that? We weren't worried. You know, when you got, and I'll just say it, you got myself and Paul Orndorff, if we can't have a, a match out of you between yeah. the two of us, you're not ready. And that's just yeah. it. It wasn't his fault. He was put out there too soon, and uh, he just wasn't ready. He wasn't for sure, and uh, and so that match goes on. Mr. Wonderful, uh, he, we see the classic pile driver, which, by the way, was there anything or anyone that did a prettier pile driver in the business arm than Paul Orndorff? Nope. He, uh, and he, what, a, what a physique. He looked the part. Every, I mean, Paul had no flaws, and that pile driver looked like a finish. Yeah. Renegade would win, but then we get the pile driver from Orndorff, and uh, and then we move on. Um, and we move on to the Dungeon of Doom, and we talked about it earlier with them adding, but they did a vignette uh, with talking about Kamala joining the group. And then all of a sudden, they do a backstage interview with Jim Duggan, and that sets up Jim Duggan, Hacksaw Jim Duggan, versus Kamala. Uh, it's their big match of the evening. There's lots of interference by the Zodiac. Kamala wins. It's a slow paced match. And we're going to just leave it at that. And we're going to move on because we spent some time with Kamala to set up the next match, which is DDP, who's wrestling on this card against Evad. Again, Dave spelled backwards, Sullivan. And Arn, this I couldn't help but think about Randy Savage, Miss Elizabeth, and George the Animal Steel all over again. Except now the players are DDP, the Diamond Doll, and Dave Sullivan. Uh, but, you know, it did have more energy than Kamala and Duggan. Diamond Cutter to win the match from DDP. It's short, it's sweet, and that match is over. Um, you'll start to realize here as we go through the card, while by many wrestling reviewers and, and folks that like to score and give stars, this was not a highly ranked pay-per-view. I think you can start to tell that just from Renegade Orndorff, Kamala Hacksaw, DDP, Dave Sullivan. Probably not our show of the year candidate. But we do then have a big three-way tag team match with some guys that you've worked quite a bit with. Harlem Heat versus the Nasty Boys versus the Blue Butt Bloods. Lord Stephen Regal and the Earl of Eaton, Bobby Eaton. A lot of bickering with these teams over the last several months. There's been titles that have changed hands. And uh, it's a three, like I said, triple threat tag match. What do you think of the chemistry of these guys? And uh, did you enjoy seeing these guys getting to work together when you think of the Harlem Heat, the Nasty Boys, and the Blue Bloods? Well, the Nasty Boys are brawlers. They would be the outside entity if you had a tag match between harlem heat and the blue bloods they would have torn the joint down oh yeah but but if you put 
you put in the nasty boys who were brawlers it gave it another element um that it didn't have and there was a history there and the there was star power there with all those guys and uh I don't remember the match, but I'm sure if Bobby Eaton was involved in it and the Blue Bloods in general, how bad could it have been? It, the Harlem Heat, they win the match, but it's a little bit of a cluster of an ending. Booker, he's on Regal, right? He's laying back on Regal for the pin, but then here comes Sags. He sits on top of Booker, and he thinks when the ref counts the three, he wins the whole thing because he's sitting on that stack. Only to find out the ref says, no, uh, Booker's laying directly on top of the bottom guy. So Harlem Heat won the tag team championships, and that's how they wrap that one out. And then from the pre-show, the stud stable are the new number one contenders. So the Harlem Heat's going to move on now and take on Bunkhouse Buck and Dirty Dick. That's going to be their next you know, set of, of challenges. Uh, so that's how they decided to wrap that one up. Okay. You're really enjoying this card so far, aren't you? <laughs> Sounds like a gimmick start to finish. It is. But that's what brings us to another gimmick match. And it's that lifeguard match, that lumberjack match. Arn, you get involved in this one. I don't know that if you remember, but it's Savage. It's Flair. Savage, uh, he's going to get a clean win here, um, which, hey, the last one, he didn't. Remember when uh, we talked about Ric Flair would take the cane and uh, and use it on Savage, the Poffo, Angelo Poffo interference, and Flair will get the win. Now they come back around, and here Savage is going to get the win. But you do get some goo-goo gaga going. You make your way into the ring. You deliver a DDT to Randy Savage, but he's going to kick out, which, uh, you know, of course he did. Bobby Heenan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> didn't take the three count after it. He hits the big elbow, pins Flair. Um, and by the way, this is far from the end for the Savage and Flair feud because at the year end, which we'll get to, they're uh, they're going to battle it out at Starcade for the WCW Championship, which Flair's going to win, but we'll get there in due time. But another fun match. Do you remember anything about being a lumberjack slash lifeguard wearing your tie-dye and your red shorts and getting involved in that match or just... Anything around that match at all? I was probably overdressed. For me, I remember exactly what it was, what the outfit looked like. Um, and it was just a souped up, basically, it wasn't a, uh, what did you call those matches in those days when you had lumberjacks? Lumberjack match, yeah. Yeah, it was yeah. just a souped up lumberjack match with outfits beach outfits yeah really yeah. yeah so it was what it was it was and again remember there's cameras around ringside and they're recording for baywatch so uh you know if you guys haven't watched baywatch in a while i'm sure you can find it online the episode that wcw is involved but again they took it directly from this event and then we move to the final match uh and that is hogan versus vader and it is in the steel cage uh, but Vader's been on what they call the roadkill tour, Arn. And that's, uh, he called that he was kicking ass from the East Coast to the West Coast, taking people out. And that culminates us here for the main event. And uh, we see Dennis Rodman. He's a part of it. He's backstage with Hogan, giving an interview, getting all into the gimmick. And uh, the match was pretty fun. At one point, Hogan puts Vader's big Mastodon head headpiece on. And he's headbutting Vader with the with the uh, with the mask on. You know they're doing all the big spots, the big uh, foot, and the and, you know few few of those few big legs. Vader's doing some moves off the second rope inside the cage, um, and it's a, it's a competitive deal until eventually Hogan would climb outside. It was a deal where he he didn't pin the guy. He climbed outside the cage, feet hit the floor first uh, to win the match. Do you think this program overall was a success? How do you how do you rate this in terms of execution, fan interest? When you think about Vader and the beast and the heel that he was for his time versus Hulk Hogan and the baby face that he was, I, I don't feel like people go back and really look at this feud as one for the for the history books. Ah, uh, you're probably right. Um, 
you know, it's such a blur back in those days because we were, I mean, just take that show right there. How many screwed up finishes? Or oh, yeah. How many goofy things were done? What was costuming done? For what reason? I mean, why were we wearing that get up that they had us wear? It was just, I don't know. In those days, we were doing our best, I guess, as a company to try to have characters and add layers to the characters and so that you could compete with the WWF at the time. And uh, we were a wrestling company. I think when we got away with performance and started catering to some of this crossover stuff, I don't know if it was the right call or not. We were the alternative. We were the better performers is the way we looked at it. Sure. That was what you were built on. You W NWA transitioning to WCW had a foundation of wrestling. You know what I mean? Of, yep. of, you know, and, and, and when you started to try to mix it and become WWF light, people could see what was happening and, but we wanted the alternative. We didn't want another cheap WWF. And I mean that with all due respect, but it just felt that way. Yeah. Well, I mean, just, it's a, we go back to the Monday morning quarterback. Okay. Let's yeah. look, let's go back and look at what we did wrong. True. Here's the deal. If you really want to simplify it, wouldn't uh, Hogan putting on Vader's headgear and headbutting them. Isn't that an outside object? And that the same thing is hitting him with a chair. Shouldn't that have been a DQ? You know? Yeah. I mean, if you're going to break it down and, and do it simplest terms, you got to look at what did they make exceptions for, which was confusing for the fans just to get a pop. Before we talk about some of the things that happened here at the culmination of the match, I have a few super chats to get to those. Michael Jensen, great to see you here, Michael, and thank you so much for the question. He said, at home, it always looked like Robin really cared to be there. Unlike a lot of other celebrities, was he actually invested like it seemed? He was a big fan. He was a blast. He was having a blast. Of course, you know, Rodman could have been a wrestler. He's look at his basketball career. Look at all the things that he got away with and how athletic he was. And when you make, when you're the guy that's getting the most rebounds in a game, not the most points or assists, but the most rebounds and you're the biggest star on the court, you've achieved right. something. That's because he's Dennis Robin and the character within. And it showed you he was flamboyant. He he was like a pro wrestler. We putting on the yes. wedding dress, doing all the crazy stuff. He was like he was he knew how to. He could have been draw. one of the boys if he could yeah. have had a he could have had a career in wrestling. Plus, yeah. he was a great athlete. Yeah, amazing athlete for sure. Uh, Instagram wrestling historian, our buddy's here tonight, and he said, "How did Ric Flair feel about Kevin Sullivan around this time replacing him as the Booker? Did Flair ever talk to you about that?" Well. Ric Flair pretty much quit. Be honest okay. with you. You yeah. know, I don't, I don't uh, you know, he did, Rick did not want to have, Rick wanted to wrestle as the world champion and be Rick Flair. He didn't want to do. That was be, never his forte that he really wanted to do. do a, be sit a down and be the booker. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't think that was what he aspired to do. Matter of fact, I know he didn't. And it was just too time consuming. He was having to deal with all the headaches with the guys. You know, he was great at booking himself as a world champion. He had no other uh, competition where that was concerned, but to now be the booker and have to book two, three shows, figure out talent, angles, all that. I just, that's not what he signed up for. I couldn't imagine the responsibility of being a full-time active wrestler plus being a booker. Well, I don't think you can do both. No. I mean, Dusty did it back in the day, right? Well, that was his, that was his forte. That, but he was, but he, to me, he had, de rare. he had yeah. decades of being the booker. Think about it. I mean, how start him in, in uh, Florida and how many years was he a booker? 20 years. Right. You know, Flair. But it's, it, but it's was, an abno Yeah, Flair doesn't mean just because you're was, a great wrestler, you wanted to do that too. Take over the book, Rick. Run the yeah. company. Yeah. 
uh it's, it's a different skill set uh no doubt well, about it yeah hey i couldn't have, i can't do that job uh nor would i want to I, but i know for a fact i couldn't do it it's great that kevin sullivan was a great booker because he could look at talent and see different ways to pair them up and make it interesting and but he had booked again he had booked for years and years too so so that's a that's a job requires experience there's a lot of people online that can tell you if you're a good booker or not i'll tell you that right now <laughs> just yes. check out twitter sometime or that i'm well, you know what we're fans of, no 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 peep in general they'll tell they'll tell some they'll, they'll talk about someone if they know they're not a good booker and a lot of, a lot of wrestling fans they can tell the difference nowadays for sure well yeah the product is shitty or not and they know what they like and they know what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. And if it doesn't make sense, why are you doing it? Yep. For sure. Uh, let's talk about what happens during the match. Vader gets injured. He takes a bump into the cage. Despite being visibly hindered Arn. he continued, he completes the match and it likely contributes to Vader's growing frustrations with WCW around this time. He felt the company wasn't managing him properly, protecting his character as that dominant monster heel. And shortly after this, his relationship with WCW sours. I mentioned the Baywatch episode in February of 96. Buddy, by the time that episode airs, Vader's working in WWF. He, he's ready <laughs> to start gearing up for WrestleMania. So uh, he's gone, and they also use this as a as a uh, idea at the time to turn him babyface. How do they do that? At the conclusion of the match, when Hogan wins, here comes Ric Flair down to the ring, and uh, he starts chastising Vader for the loss. Vader then starts beating the crap out of Ric Flair, and who comes down to help out Ric Flair? You, sir, in your tie-dye shirt and your red shorts come running right into the ring. You start throwing fists at Big Vader. And uh, he ends up chasing you both off, and he challenges both of you guys to a fight. Says he'll take you both on. But, uh, man, WCW handling a Vader at this point creatively, not happy, injured, and, and he's going to be gone here soon. Thoughts on how that all kind of got mismanaged and out of whack for Vader and his, his career there at WCW. Oh, does this lead you to the Orndorff situation? That I don't, uh, backstage. I don't, yeah, I got, I, I'd have to, that's down the road. Here. I have to dig in and say exactly when the Orndorff says the whole, that whole deal went down. I, I can't remember off the top of my head. Well, let me, I know this, I do remember is me coming down and jumping on Vader and then him cleaning house. It, they, it was, you, you nailed it. You, it was six weeks later, the Vader Orndorff. Thanks well, research guy. So they booked a match. I know that it was a handicap match Vader against Flair and I. That would have happened after the run yeah. in and all that. And Vader beat us both. I did, however, spine buster Vader, if you can believe that. If you want to go back and pull it's, that uh, it's up. All, it's all over online. You can find it everywhere online, the spine buster to Vader. Which was unheard of. Yeah. Of course, it didn't beat him, but. But you still got his big ass up and rotated those pretty, hips. Pretty damn impressive, if I say so myself. Hell yeah. You've spawn bustered Vader. You've spawn bustered Undertaker. I mean, come, I mean, it's legendary, the list of spawn busters. I knew that. Yeah. I just didn't want to be that. You didn't want to be that. I'll, I'll toot, I'll toot, toot I'll for you. <laughs> toot, toot. Okay, so Andrew said yes, six weeks. A wrestling historian said it happened the next month, uh, Arn, August of 90, 1995. And uh, he, Andrew said, fun fact, it was not the first time that you gave him the spawn buster. So there you go. All right. The birthday boy dropping some knowledge. So definitely toot toot on that. But yeah, Vader was not handled right. And then this, and then, and then the incident with Orndorff, it, it is not going well with, uh, with Vader and WCW at this point. No, wasn't. I don't think there is an answer to. Yeah, yeah. 
Wow. Well, he he would go on to uh, to bigger and better things, uh, and he's moving on to the WWF. Guys, we're at 55 minutes. If you have questions, throw them in the chat, super chat uh, as well as available. But, Arn, that's really uh, the, the build and the wrap-up of Bash at the Beach 1995. Just in general, what are your thoughts, memories around this period of time uh, that you can recall besides the tie-dye shirt and you being a lifeguard? Well, I just think we're grasping at straws and doing anything we could possibly do. And I think I remember they shot a video with, with uh, was it Sid and Vader and Sting and Davy Boy on the beach, yeah. out on the beach and had a argument. A lot of beach stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Had a promo out there. I mean, they were, they were trying their best as a company to, to be entertainment and be as entertaining and utilize the characters as best they can. I just, I just don't know if, if we were ready for that. Be honest yeah. with you. This is the calm before the storm. And when I say that, meaning this is not a time period where it's finally looked back on of WCW, obviously yes, Hogan's here and there's a buzz and things are happening. Business is going to pick up here soon. We're going to get into the Monday night wars. And, you know, as the months go down and as we continue down the road with this podcast, we're going to get into, you know, what's going on with, with Nitro and what's going on with the end, formation of the NWO and a lot of fun stuff here. But uh, Andrew also reminded us that the, uh, the, the vignette you're talking about was from Beach Blast 93 and we made you watch the, uh, the bomb on the boat vignette where the, uh, the little person... Uh, put the bomb on the boat. Remember that whole deal, the vignette with uh, on the beach. <laughs> there were some vignettes we made him watch. We made him watch the White Castle of Fear as well, the one in the in the castle with Vader. I will, we refuse, I will, I will refuse to watch anything like that again. <laughs> you, We've had a lot of fun with you on this show, man. You and the gentleman that comes up with all this stuff and gets it's it. Andrew. It's the birthday boy. If you're an Andrew, think you're going to kick me into nuts every chance you get, you are wrong again. When you oh, watched it, you uh, told Andrew he could go turn himself outside on the porch and run himself right into that tree in his front yard. It was hilarious. <laughs> and we popped so hard. <laughs> <laughs> When you said you wanted to go through your career on this podcast, I don't think you remembered all these good times too, pal. Yeah, dude, but I didn't mean it. all of it. <laughs> oh, yeah. We're not we, letting it go. Can we cherry pick some of the better, <laughs> no. easier stuff? No, we're, we're, we're going to take you through the painful times too. That's part of oh. the entertainment. This has been entertaining, and I'm glad you guys have been along for the ride, and I want to thank you all for uh, for checking us out. Arn, I don't see any more Super Chats, so uh, I want to thank all of you that were here watching us here on the live show and all your great questions, chiming in, helping us out on the show uh, with reminders. And uh, let's see here. Yeah, they love the fun stuff, Arn. Ryan, others, Charlie. I want to thank you all for being here, Rob. Uh, Vader was on his way to Spinebuster City. Toot, toot. And uh, a lot of uh, folks chiming in. So we appreciate all the support. Guys, make sure you check it out. One true sport.com for all the merch. As we mentioned, Arn's going to be at GalaxyCon this weekend. If you're in the area, make sure you go see him. Uh, you can find his comic book again at Amazon.com. Come back in one week's time for Ask Arn Almost Anything. And that's where. I back out and I let you guys ask the questions. I just narrate and, and, and facilitate all the questions for Arn, and we have a really good time together. It's going to be the last show for a few weeks as we wrap up and, and head into the holiday season. And you guys have been awesome supporters of the Arn show and of Arn, and so we can't thank you enough. Uh, Charlie says, you gentlemen have a fantastic week and always be safe. You do the same, buddy. Ryan, Andrew, all of you, thank you so much. Arn, thank you so much for doing this with me this week. I love you guys. Oh, I love you, Paul. You're a good man. Uh, well, Arn, I love doing this with you, and you're uh, one of my close pals and buddies, and I'm so glad uh, and fortunate that I get to do this with you. And we're going to put a bow on it right now. On behalf of the Enforcer, Arn Anderson, my tag team partner, this is Paul Bromwell, and we'll see you right back here next week on another episode of Arn.